She toured extensively with David Bowie, collaborated with astronaut Chris Hadfield on a recording done from the space station, and has been nominated for numerous honors, including Canadian Folk Awards and Juno Awards. But as for many of us, this year has been all about change. And singer-songwriter M. Griner's new album, A Jazz Offering, captures that in spades. It's called Just For You. And there is M. Griner, now in St. Mary's, Ontario, home of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, just south of Stratford. Hello, M. It's so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Well, let's start by getting to know you a little bit better, starting with that first name, M, E-M-M. -M. What's the story there? You're really starting from the beginning. Uh, well, um, it's a name I actually gave myself in college. And you know, the decisions we make in college are important. So um, I was actually born Mary, and I didn't really like how that sounded as a rock and roll name. So I just changed my name. And where did the E-M-M -M come from? From the M of Mary. Yeah. Gotcha. It's kind of like Erica M, the VJ, who took M as her last name because her real last name starts with M and is too long to pronounce, she says. Yeah, if we went out for dinner, it'd get very confusing. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, at what age were you when you started singing, writing songs, all of that? I was around 10. I wrote songs about nature. Um, and then I discovered boys. So I started writing about boys. And um, from there, it really grew. I started writing about my family and coming of age and um, just really loved songwriting. That was my first love. Now, you didn't exactly grow up a stone's throw from all of the biggest mu music studios in the world in downtown Toronto or Los Angeles or something. You grew up, do I have this right? You're outside Sarnia Forest? That's right, yes, in between Sarnia and Forest. Okay, so how does somebody even begin to think about a professional music career from there? Well, it was pretty much all I could think about because there was nothing to do but feed some chickens and um, shop at the mall, the Lambton Mall. Woo -woo. <laughs> um, so actually, you know, um, a friend of mine, Larry Gowan, he said, boredom creates invention. Out of boredom comes invention. And that's what, what childhood was. There was literally nothing to do. So I just wrote songs and, um, and listened to music. It's funny you call him Larry Gowan because, of course, he's, he's only Gowan now, right? He dropped the Larry a long time ago. Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know. I can't keep track of anything in pandemic. So. <laughs> That's a good point. Can we show a little clip? Of course we can. It's our show. We can do whatever we want. No, we want to show a clip of you singing back up for somebody who's, well, he's a bit of a legend, shall we say? Sheldon, let's see this, please. Em, how did that come to you? You and David Bowie. Yeah, well, literally one weekend in 1999, I was playing at the Forest Fall Fair on a flatbed truck. And a week later, I was on Saturday Night Live with Bowie. And it was just the, um, I suppose it was that I was dropped from my record label um, in 1998. <laughs> and then I just felt free to go anywhere. So I went to New York and I did some shows and that's when I met his bandmates and they brought me into the band. Well, we should say the record label dropped you because it was an ownership change. So you were one of the casualties in all of that. But, uh, you know, as a backup singer, how well do you get to know the guy who's at the front of the stage? Really well, actually. Um, David was really, he treated his band like family and, you know, we, we went out for dinners together and... Um, I really got to glimpse a side of him that not many people would. Um, and I learned so much from him. You know, there was obviously the celebrity side of it, which was great hotels and flying all over the place and famous people. But there was also the curiosity. He was very um, joyful and um, energized. And I took that as a huge lesson as someone who was transitioning from a big label back to my own career. Hmm. Now, how about Chris Hadfield on Space Oddity? How did that come to you? Uh, Chris and I are both from the Sarnia area. Um, He's got and... an airport named after him, and you've got some work <laughs> to do on that one, I think. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so we had become friends because I wrote a song about him, uh, about one of his missions. Um, I called it Christopher. And it appears on my um, Juno-nominated album, Asian Blue. And uh, we became friends. And then when he became commander of the space station, he called up 
uh, from space and said, would you like to collaborate on some music? So um, I'd just given birth to my second child and, you know, a dirty diaper in one hand and the phone <laughs> in the other hand. And I said, yes. That's motherhood, right? Multitasking all the time. <laughs> it's true. Now, it's interesting. I've talked to many female artists over the years who, once they have children, uh, life obviously becomes very different from a practical point of view, but their inspiration for their work also becomes different. Did you go through that as well? Yes. I mean, I think life changed dramatically when I had kids, um, just in terms of uh, seeing the truth in life. Um, I'm not sure I really took a good look at myself until kids popped out of my body. Um, so I think when you see that truth, it changes your art and it changes what you write. And I went through a huge transformation as a result of having them. I mean, there was obviously the loss of time, but um, what I lost in time and energy, I eventually kind of got back f with, with so many other gifts. So, you know, I know there's a lot of young moms that struggle in the early years. I, I certainly did, but um, you sort of barrel through and you find your way. I know we've had Amy Sky on this program before, and when she had children, it, it completely changed the way she regarded the music business. It changed the way she, it changed what she wanted to write about, what she wanted to sing about. I mean, it was a very, very important 180 in her life. Did you experience mm -hmm. anything that profound, do you think? Well, absolutely. And I think in the last five years, I've gone through a huge transformation where I've really tried to be, um, you know, as a musician and a pop star, you kind of, an indie pop star, you sort of have the focus on yourself the whole time, right? So then when you have kids, you, you start to look outward. And I think looking outward has been a huge shift for me in the last few years. You know, it's like, what kind of a mom do I want my daughter to see? What kind of woman do I want my daughter to be around? Um, would I like her to see me doing the things that I love? Um, and also would I like her to see me loved and happy? So a lot of changes happen for the better because of them. Understood. The new album is called Just For You, and we should start by asking, first of all, who's the you? The you is my dad, Jim. Shout out to dad. He's actually the first person who introduced me to TVO, you know, many, 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 many nights watching TVO. Um, That's good parenting. <laughs> yeah. So watching lots of movies. Um, but at that same time that we were, I was young, my dad introduced me to a lot of jazz and it was the last thing I wanted to listen to. I just wanted to listen to Def Leppard and Madonna. Um, but in recent years, I've really fallen in love with it and seen um, another side of it. And I wanted to make him an album of songs that he chose. So I literally said one Father's Day, you know, instead of giving him a Tim Hortons tin of coffee, I said, I'll make you an album. So tell me what the songs are. And within 10 minutes, he wrote out all the songs. Good decision. I, I got to ask, <laughs> when, when's his birthday? Uh, September 10th. Okay. The reason I ask is you and I are a day apart, and my dad also introduced me to jazz. So if their birthdays were a day apart, I was going to say there's something very, very kismet going on here, but there's not, because my dad's in August, so it's a month apart. Let's show some, it's, it's pretty close, but not that close. Let's, uh, let's see some butterflies, shall we? Or we'll, we'll listen to some butterflies anyway. Sheldon, next clip, please. There were butterflies in skies of blue, but now nothing goes as we planned. And I'm trying to understand. the day when those butterflies are miles away. Mm. First of all, two things. Number one, the camera loves you. Number two, <laughs> what a voice. You've got such a beautiful voice. And, yeah. and number three, a bunch of interesting choices there that I want to get into right now. Namely, the idea to do this kind of home movie style. What's the, what's the thinking there? Well, it's a pandemic. Um, <laughs> and also, I, in recent years, I've really realized you can do a lot with a little. And um, 
this song, you know, it just needed me singing it somewhere. So I just literally took the camera around with me and a friend of mine, Daryl Latima, just put it together in his living room. And I think that's one thing about this time. I know it's a struggle for many people, but there has been like a emphasis on like, let's be resourceful. Let's be creative. Let's just uh, be a bit grateful for what we have. And that was shot where? Just around my house in the backyard. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny because it looks like, of course, it, 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 it has the richness uh, to it that suggests that you had a whole team of people sitting around, you know, in an office somewhere for hour upon hour and think about, okay, how are we going to figure this shot out here and we need this background and uh, uh, none of that, eh? None of that. Just ad living no. with a camera. Yeah, and thanks for saying that because I do. I have had those experiences, as a lot of musicians have, of that team making a video, and sometimes it doesn't turn out that well when you've got like 50 people working on it. So, um, you know, I I do love to tell people like you can do this, like you can make a video, you can make an album on your own, and I've always I've been saying this for two decades. So, how much of a departure is that style of singing for you from what you've done heretofore? That's a good question. I mean, my fans who have been so great, they just fund album after album and stay with me through crazy changes. Um, this album was a surprise for them. But I think that I've always just loved song, like great songs with great melodies and all different kinds of singers. So with myself, I love to explore different kinds of singing. So I have a rock band and, you know, I, I, try to sing as high as Ronnie James Dio. Um, but then I also have this softer side and I think it's okay to like embrace all of those sides. So to be honest, singing this way was very natural. It was a one take thing. Um, I was singing with the band and it just felt good. So. Oh, never mind that it's acceptable. It's fabulous that you did it. And, and, you know, lots of people like Rod Stewart get to a certain point in life where they say, you know, I want to try finding a different side of me. And he's done, you know, obviously a number of jazz al albums that turned out very well. And this one I'm sure will for you as well. Have you, have you had feedback from the fans on what they think? Yeah, I, and I'm so thrilled that I hear the same thing over and over that, you know, I didn't know that I like jazz or I didn't, I'm not usually a jazz fan. And mind you, I'm a pop singer, right, primarily. So there's going to be an element of jazz pop to this, but it was new for me. Uh, it was new for me to listen to the music a little differently, find the beats differently. Um, so it was a challenge for me. It was a challenge for my fans, but I think everyone's really enjoyed it. Now, as you and your chief of staff, namely your father, went through the list of songs that he either did or did not want to see on the album, how did you work all that out? Well, my dad picked 10 songs. Eight of them are standards that... Um, made it on the album, like Cry Me a River, Orange Colored Sky, Nevertheless, songs like that. But he did pick a song called My Heart Belongs to Daddy, <laughs> which I just started of course he did. working on it. And it was just like, Dad, this is that's where I draw the line. So I just put some of my own songs on instead, which, you know, he loves the originals too. So And Butterflies was one of the ones you wrote. Yes, I wrote it with a guy named Joe Corcoran, who is a Canadian living in L.A. And... Um, yeah, it was, I really love how it turned out. You did the whole LA thing for a while too, yes? I did, yeah, I lived there for, well, I lived there for a year. And? Too much sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I love the seasons, which seems odd to say, seeing as uh, I'm buried in snow right now. But um, yeah, I, I think it's great to like travel and visit new places. Um, I'm just such a Canadian girl and I find so much inspiration um, living back in the area where I was a teenager. And I think there's a lot like that we can access about our joy when we kind of go back to our roots in a way. Um, so I, yeah, LA, maybe LA would be great right now for a week. For a week, yeah, yeah. Well, we're delighted to have been able to repatriate you. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I would like to know how, um, mortified or ticked off or whatever you find the right word, you're trying to launch a new product in the middle of a global pandemic when no one can gather to hear you play. 
What's that like? That's a really good question. Um, I think, well, I and en- I ended my fundraising for this album right when the pandemic began, and I was shocked that I could raise this kind of money when something like that was sort of reaching people as a reality. Um, to put the record out in the pandemic, it's it's actually been pretty amazing. I've been able to meet a lot of new people in the jazz world. Like that's the bonus of doing something new at this time, because normally I would put an album, I would have a publicist and like do the rounds. But with this, I really like I got on the phone to people. Um, I really learned about some of these jazz writers and jazz journalists. And it's provided more connection and it's provided more closeness. And um, even though I'm not playing like a big launch party, I did play uh, in my parents' backyard. (laughs) Socially (laughs) distanced, I hope. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, you know, they are actually in a gazebo, so it was more than socially distant. It was hmm. almost like uh, someone was in jail or something. But um, yeah, it, it's been great, and I've been playing in driveways for senior citizens here in my town. It's there's a joy in it that is different from the regular. You know, you just have to think differently. Well, I got to follow up on that because the notion that you could actually experience deeper connection or more profound connection at a time when you're really not supposed to be near anybody and only talking to people over Zoom, as opposed to with a big launch party where you're actually going to sell a lot of units and be cheek by jowl with all sorts of people. How, how, explain that to me. How is it more, how is the connection deeper this way? Well, I think, you know, I mean, like even you and I right now, Steve, (laughs) it's like, I can see you, I can see me. And I think even with my fans, like we are doing these Zoom calls and online stuff, I wouldn't have been doing that if this wasn't going on. So I think that it's just been a little bit of a shift in, um, expectations, I guess, right? Um, And seeing some of the new ways that you can connect with people. It might not be quantity, but I definitely feel like there's such a quality of connection um, if you make the effort, right? Like, I know I did not want to get on Zoom with anyone when this started, really. (laughs) But But now you got no choice. This is the way this is the way we do business nowadays. It is the way. And it's weird. You get a chance to see yourself. And that's another thing, you know, like we're if you if there was any time to like really take a look at yourself, literally, and maybe deeper than that, now's the time. Well, there has been a lot of innovation and ingenuity by yourself, by other artists as they try to get their their goods and their wares and their talent out to the world. Um, One wonders, though, whether all of this disappears once the pandemic is over and we've all got our shots or whether this is a new way of doing business that will be more permanent? What do you think? It's a really good question. It's hard to tell the future. Um, I fear that we might go back to kind of just the normal rat race. I would say 90% of everyone I speak to, and maybe the viewers feel the same, have felt, you know, if they've had a, you know, a chance to breathe during this time, um, They've, they wanted the break. Um, so I try to tell some of the people I work with, I do a lot of vocal coaching. I try to tell them, you know, what is it about this time that is working for you and take it with you past this, uh, past the end of it. You know, we, I feel like we are, we've just been all maxed out a little bit. Well, uh, let me just conclude by saying as connected as I feel to my fellow Gemini born one day apart in the month of June, I do look forward to the day when I'm actually allowed to bump your elbow or shake your hand, God forbid, um, and do this in person, because this was great fun, and I'm so delighted to meet you, and I wish you just great good fortune with Just For You, your latest. Thanks a lot, Em. Thanks, Steve. See you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.